This week, we heard outrage, tears, and calls for justice from Indigenous peoples all over Canada for Joyce Echequan. Joyce Echequan was an Atikamekw woman and mother of seven children who died in a Quebec hospital, but not before recording the vicious racism of hospital staff who were supposed to help her in her time of need. What her video recording showed is not an anomaly, it's not an exception, nor is it evidence of one or two bad apples. This video is a snapshot of the deeply ingrained racism that Indigenous peoples are subjected to at hospitals, doctor's offices, and health clinics every single day in Canada. And it's also one of the reasons why we hold Sisters in Spirit vigils on October 4th, to honor and remember all of the Indigenous women and girls who have been subjected to racist violence, neglect, abuse, exploitation, disappearances, and murders. So today's video is very important. Please stay tuned to learn more about why October 4th is such an important day. Welcome back, warriors. Kwe Tanse Sego. Hi, my name is Pam Palmiter, and welcome to my YouTube channel where we focus on educating the resistance and inspiring the next generation of warriors to help us save our peoples and the planet. Today, this video, like so many others on this channel, will be difficult. It is October 4th, where many people engage in Sisters in Spirit vigils all over Canada. The vigil started about 15 years ago as a way to both honor the lives of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, but also as a way to draw attention to the issue and pressure the government for urgent action. Sisters in Spirit was an initiative led by the Native Women's Association of Canada and the families of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls to research and document the numbers of those who had gone murdered and missing. When these vigils first started, there were only a few, and now there are literally hundreds of them organized by the Native Women's Association of Canada, families of Sisters in Spirit, community organizations, families, and grassroots people. And they are held every year on October 4th and within the weeks leading up to and after that date. The Native Women's Association of Canada explains that the purpose of these vigils is a way to, quote, honor the lives of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and gender diverse people, support grieving families, and create opportunities for healing. It's also a form of advocacy. And after many years of advocacy here in Canada and internationally at the United Nations Human Rights Treaty Bodies and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, Canada finally bowed to the pressure to have a national inquiry into the crisis. The National Inquiry released their final report more than a year ago in June of 2019. They found Canada guilty of both historic and ongoing genocide of Indigenous peoples, which also specifically targeted Indigenous women and girls, and is the reason for the high rates of violence against them. The National Inquiry called on Canada to take urgent and immediate action, yet 16 months later, and we hear nothing but silence. Canada's first excuse was that they needed to consider the report. Then, they were busy with the election. Then, they were focused on pipelines. And now it's COVID. Canada has literally proven to us what the National Enquiry had found for itself. That all levels of government and society treat the lives of Indigenous women and girls as less worthy and as a result are given the lowest priority attention in Canada. The genocide of Indigenous peoples is the biggest human rights crisis that has ever faced Canada. Yet it's treated like just another program or initiative that will get some minor attention when it's convenient for Canada. Yet addressing the genocide of Indigenous women and girls should have been at the heart of Canada's COVID measures, since it's the generations of violence, abuse, neglect, and enforced poverty that makes Indigenous women and girls at high risk during a pandemic. In other words, for Indigenous women and girls and indeed all Indigenous peoples, remedying genocide is the best prevention during pandemics. We are not inherently high risk. We are strong people impacted by violent external forces not of our own doing. 
Remedying the lack of clean drinking water and sanitation on reserve would go a long way towards preventing the spread of the virus. Remedying food insecurity would go a long way towards making healthier communities to be able to better fight off the more serious impacts of the virus. And similarly, remedying homelessness would help keep people protected and sheltered and at less risk from the virus. But it goes even deeper than that. Placing a moratorium on things like pipelines which was recommended by the United Nations Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, would stop man camps. Man camps which house hundreds, even thousands of men in tight quarters near indigenous communities that greatly increase the risk of transmission. Man camps also increase the risk of violence, sexual assaults, exploitation, disappearances, and murders of indigenous women and girls in Canada and the United States. A moratorium would have provided instant protection in relation both to the pandemic and the rates of violence. Giving our lands and resources back, respecting our Aboriginal and treaty rights, and our rights to be self-determining would also go a long ways towards ending the enforced dependency on government programs which are deeply embedded with racism and disdain for Indigenous peoples. The many months of anti-racism protests with black and indigenous peoples all over Canada and the United States called out the kinds of state-based violence that we have endured for generations. While many focused on police racism, brutality and killings of black and indigenous peoples by police, it's also about the over-incarceration and brutality experienced in prison. And it's also about the racism in all public services, from policing, education, child and family services, even health care. The state has been and continues to be a perpetrator of racialized violence and discrimination against black and indigenous peoples, but also racialized and sexualized violence against indigenous women and girls in particular. And while the National Enquiry found that all levels of government were guilty of genocide, they also pointed to the high rates of racism and violence in society, in the extractive industry, social workers, police officers, and doctors. Literally, our next door neighbors. And while we all wish that this kind of violent racism was only a matter of a few bad apples, we know both from lived experience and the overwhelming documented evidence that it is systemic, it's widespread, and it's well known. This year's October 4th is especially painful for the children, husband, family, friends, and community members of Joyce Echequan. We all offer our condolences and prayers for this family. No one deserves to start their journey to the spirit world in such a racist, uncaring, and violent manner by healthcare workers that were supposed to care for Joyce in her critical time of need. And it's important to note that what happened to Joyce is not an accident. It is not a misunderstanding. It was not some unconscious bias or an inevitable clash of cultures. The Minister of Indigenous Services Canada, Mark Miller, spoke out and explained that the best case scenario was that Joyce died at the hands of a racist. And the worst case scenario is much worse and makes you think about criminality. What happened to Joyce is an act of blatant racism, neglect, and abuse. To blame an Indigenous woman for her urgent medical condition. To complain that they would have to pay for her care. To belittle and degrade her and call her stupid while she was suffering in pain. To tell her that she was only good for sex. And then to tell her she would be better off dead. These racist sentiments literally sum up the National Enquiry's findings about the racialized and sexualized violence experienced by Indigenous women and girls at all levels of society, in government, police, healthcare, child welfare, the education system, and beyond. And we know that this isn't the first incident of racism at the Joliet Hospital in Quebec or throughout the entire healthcare system in Quebec. The chief of Manawan, the community from which Joyce originates, told the media that there have been many problems at that hospital. Yet even in the face of prior complaints and countless examples of racist treatment, hospital administration denies systemic racism. 
not unlike Quebec Premier Legault, who continues to deny that there's any systemic racism against Native peoples in Quebec. It's no surprise then that Quebec has failed to move on the critical recommendations from the Vienne Commission, which found systemic racism in public services, including health care. The Vienne Commission concluded, and I quote, Having completed my analysis, it seems impossible to deny that members of First Nations and Inuit are victims of systemic discrimination in their relations with public services that are the subject of this inquiry. Yet that is exactly what the Premier of Quebec did. Deny the reality, which only serves to allow it to continue. The Commission went on to conclude, Many current institutional practices, standards, laws, and policies remain a source of discrimination and inequality to the point where they significantly taint the quality of services offered to First Nations and Inuit. In some cases, this lack of sensitivity manifests as a complete lack of service, which leaves entire populations to their own devices with no ability to remedy their situations. In this way, thousands have been stripped not only of their rights, but of their dignity, as they are forced to live under deplorable conditions, deprived of their own cultural references. In a developed society such as ours, this reality is simply unacceptable. But just like the federal government has failed to act on the National Inquiry, the Quebec government has also failed to take urgent action on the Viennes Commission. While the health care workers involved should of course be fired, they should also lose their ability to work in any health care field again. But it would be a mistake to think that only those workers are culpable. We have long ago dispensed with the myth of a few bad apples. Many Indigenous peoples have shared experiences of being denied treatment or access to hospital care under the racist presumption that they were drunk or that they caused their own situation. Many Indigenous women fear having their children at a hospital because of the high rate of social workers who apprehend their babies at birth something which is at crisis levels in the province of Manitoba. Women and girls have been forced or coerced into being sterilized or having abortions, which is the subject of an ongoing class action. In British Columbia, there's an ongoing investigation into racism in hospitals against Indigenous peoples. And don't forget about Brian Sinclair, a 45-year-old Indigenous man who was a double amputee and died of preventable sepsis from a bladder infection after a 34-hour wait at the Winnipeg Health Sciences Centre. He was literally ignored to death despite pleas from other patients to help him. Racism kills. It kills our children, our men, our women, our elders. And not just culturally, socially, and spiritually, but mentally and physically as well. Racism is a form of violence that has been oppressing, dispossessing, and killing Indigenous peoples since contact. And it's not the exception, it is the rule. Nor is it hidden, unknown, or just newly discovered. Racism against Indigenous peoples has been studied and measured with precision for decades. There are countless coroner's reports, inquests, inquiries, and commissions that have presented both the evidence and the ways to remedy the racism and save lives. Yet every time governments, institutions, agencies, and individuals choose not to stop the racism, choose instead to neglect, abuse, exploit, oppress, dispossess, and underserve Indigenous peoples. In this way, they are all complicit in the lethal outcomes. And this is why October 4th vigils are so important. It's about supporting the families and communities, ensuring that the lives of Indigenous women and girls like Joyce Echequan and Tina Fontaine are never forgotten. October 4th serves to remind Canada that Indigenous women and girls are loved, they are a part of their families, their communities, and their nations. Indigenous women are powerful. They are life givers and caretakers, as well as warriors and protectors. 
They are the heart of our nations and have served our families, communities, clans, houses, villages, and nations as political strategists, negotiators, advisors, educators, and leaders. Despite the generations of genocide and violence, Indigenous women continue to engage in acts of resistance against colonial oppression, act in cultural resurgence in our communities, and contribute to the revitalization of our languages, cultures, autonomies, and nations. Indigenous women are on the front lines of the resistance, alongside of our men, children, elders, and our allies, protecting our peoples, our lands, and our waters. We value and respect these women. If Canada and the world even hopes to have a future, they better step up and protect these warriors as they are the best hope we have at saving this planet and ensuring that we all collectively have a future. Rest in strength, Joyce Echequan, Tina Fontaine, Aisha Hudson, Chantal Moore, and all of our sisters. Till next time, stay alert, warriors.